Perhaps no other topic has been written about in the West more than Christianity. In the past 2,000 years, tomes on the faith have been written by kings, monks, and laymen alike. One might conclude that no other faith has inspired and been inspired by great literature quite like Christianity. Therefore, in this video I aim to highlight the most prolific literature of Christianity. These works were written to lead and inspire the faithful through practical application of teachings or by theological exploration of Christianity's mysteries. In this first installment, we will focus on the years 0 to 600 AD to investigate the earliest Christian works. So let's explore the most important works of the early church. No list of Christian literature could be taken seriously without including the most famous book of all time, the Bible. Coming from the Latin Biblia, literally meaning book, the Bible is actually a collection of books written by various authors starting in the late Bronze Age up until the Roman era in the first century. Consisting of the Old Testament, which features Jewish history, prophecy, and poetry, and the New Testament focused on the life of Christ and the development of the early church, the Bible is central to Christianity because, according to the faithful, it is the Word of God. The current canon of books was formalized in the 4th century through various councils. The Council of Rome in 382, the Council of Hippo in 393, and the Council of Carthage in 397. Here's a snippet from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The Didache is a brief discourse written in the first century that contains catechetical, ethical, and ritualistic teachings. Detailed instructions on the rites of baptism and the Eucharist, as well as fasting practices and the complete Lord's Prayer are contained within. In one section, the Didache reflects on two divergent paths, the way of life and the way of death, reminding the reader to bear the whole yoke of the Lord and to avoid certain vices. In the section on baptism, the author prescribes the well-known formula in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, to be recited as the person is immersed in living water when available. This section is particularly fascinating because the rite described is so familiar to Christians today, as the document affirms the formula used in baptism now is the same as that used by the earliest Christians in the first century. Though mentioned by early Christians such as Eusebius, the Didache was lost to history until its rediscovery in 1883 by a Greek Orthodox Metropolitan. Here's a snippet from the work. You shall not exalt yourself, nor give overconfidence to your soul. You shall not be joined with lofty ones, but with just and lowly ones shall it have its intercourse. Accept whatever happens to you as good, knowing that apart from God, nothing comes to pass. The Shepherd of Hermas was a popular book among Christians in the first few centuries after Christ's death. Some church fathers, such as Irenaeus, even considered the work to be canonical scripture. Hermas, a freed slave living in the Roman Empire and brother to Pope Pius I, is thought to be the author, though this is disputed. Some have hypothesized that the author is the same Hermas that Paul refers to in his letter to the Romans. The book centers around several visions, commandments, and parables given to the author in order to further the faithful's understanding of Christian ethics. In one interesting vision, the author sees a tower built of stones representing the church made up of its baptized members. An angel explains that the baptized can be cast out of the church if they commit grave sins, though are admitted back after repentance. The shepherd is sometimes compared to the more modern work Pilgrim's Progress because it is believed to be mostly allegorical. Here's a section of the work. Only be not thou careless, but take courage and strengthen thy family. For as the smith hammering his work conquers the task which he wills, so also doth righteous discourse repeated daily conquer all evil. Cease not therefore to reprove thy children, for I know that if they shall repent with all their heart, they shall be written in the books of life with the saints. 
Eusebius wrote church history in an attempt to chronicle the development of the early church from the time of the apostles until his time in the 4th century. As bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius had access to the library of Caesarea, which was a highly influential Christian library that once housed over 30,000 texts. This allowed him to piece together a narrative of the early church through letters, martyr accounts, lists of bishops, and other documents. His work focuses primarily on the following topics. Bishop's line of succession in the principal sees, notable Christian teachers, heresies, Jewish history, Christian relations with non-Christians, and martyrdoms. The bishop's work contains many quotes from original sources that have since been lost making church history a work of historical importance. Scholarly consensus is divided over the accuracy of the work. Some critics have accused Eusebius of outright fabrication, while most modern scholars make a more nuanced case that Eusebius attempted his best with the limited resources he had at his disposal. Here's a section of the work. But most wonderful of all is the fact that we, who have consecrated ourselves to him, honor him not only with our voices and with the sound of words, but also with the complete elevation of soul, so that we choose to give testimony unto him rather than to preserve our own lives. A 4th century classic, On the Incarnation, was written by St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, as a defense of Christ's nature against various heresies that were prominent at the time. Athanasius explains why God became man as a solution to what he calls the divine dilemma of man's fallen nature. He also expounds upon the nature of the Trinity and pushes back against the Arian heresy, which claimed that Jesus had been created by God. The work quotes scripture extensively while explaining the teachings of the early church. The book has been hugely influential on Christian theology, even until modern times. C.S. Lewis said of the work, When I first opened the Incarnation, I soon discovered by a very simple test that I was reading a masterpiece. Here's a section of this masterpiece. He, the life of all, our Lord and Savior, did not arrange the manner of his own death, lest he should seem to be afraid of some other kind. No, he accepted and bore upon the cross a death inflicted by others, and those other his special enemies, a death which to them was supremely terrible and by no means to be faced. And he did this in order that, by destroying even this death, he might himself be believed to be the life and the power of death be recognized as finally annulled. A marvelous and mighty paradox has thus occurred, for the death which they thought to inflict on him as dishonor and disgrace has become the glorious moment to death's defeat. Confessions is a work that I've talked about multiple times for good reason. St. Augustine's autobiography has maintained a wide readership since it was first completed around 400 AD. In the work, Augustine reflects on his sinful youth and eventual conversion to Christianity as he traversed the late Roman Empire. Augustine tells of his time as a member of the Manichaean religion, his profession as a successful orator, the bloody spectacle of the gladiatorial games, and his struggles with chastity. His work features two other notable figures that played a role in his conversion and joined him in sainthood, St. Saint Monica, his mother, and St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan with whom he debated fiercely. In addition to his autobiography, Augustine includes his contemplations on theological and metaphysical topics. Here's a snippet of the work. And men go abroad to admire the heights of mountains, the mighty waves of the sea, the broad tides of rivers, the compass of the ocean, and the circuits of the stars, yet pass over the mystery of themselves without a thought. Another classic by Augustine, this early 5th century philosophical work presents the saint's intellect in full force. The City of God was a response to critics who suggested that the decline of the Roman Empire was brought about by the rise of Christianity. The work depicts the human condition as a battleground between the earthly city and the city of God, and all of history as a war between God and the devil. The denizens of the early city are those that have given themselves to the concerns and vices of the material world, 
while the citizens of the city of God are those that have given up the cares of the world in the hope of the next. All people, cities, governments, and military forces, knowingly or unknowingly, work toward the earthly city led by the devil, or toward the city of God guided by God. Augustine's work is considered one of the great theological works of all time, and has been highly influential to Western philosophers and theologians throughout the centuries. Here's a taste. This joy in God is not like any pleasure found in physical or intellectual satisfaction, nor is it such as a friend experiences in the presence of a friend. But if we are to use any such analogy, it is more like the eye rejoicing in light. The Sayings of the Desert Fathers, as the title suggests, is a collection of texts describing various wisdom stories and maxims attributed to the Desert Fathers, who were some of the earliest hermits and ascetics living mostly in Egypt during the 5th century. Most of the stories take the form of a conversation between a younger monk and a spiritual elder, or Abba, where the elder bestows wisdom to his counterpart. Early monks looked to these stories for inspiration and spiritual guidance, as many figures mentioned in the text are canonized saints, like St. Saint Anthony the Great and St. Moses the Black. Early theologians like Jerome and Augustine were possibly influenced by the work. Many of these stories were originally oral traditions in the Coptic language, but were later written down in Greek. Here's a story from the work. The devil appeared to a monk disguised as an angel of light, and said to him, I am the angel Gabriel, and I have been sent to you. But the monk said, Are you sure you weren't sent to someone else? I am not worthy to have an angel sent to me. At that the devil vanished. No other work has influenced monastic life as much as the rule of Saint Benedict. Since Benedict of Nursia first formulated his guidelines in 516 AD, the rule has been followed by Benedictine monks as well as other religious orders for 15 centuries. The work is simply a guidebook on how monks should live communally. Benedict's plan was intended as a moderate path between the extreme asceticism of solitary monks and the more formal institutions of the church. This middle way emphasizes the practices of prayer and manual labor while maintaining a strong community among participants. Benedict modeled his vision of the ideal monastic life on the family and though written mainly for monks, is also relevant to religious women living under an abbess. This broad applicability helped to popularize the work as it could be used by a variety of communities. Since his work has been so highly influential and long-lasting, Benedict is often credited with being the founder of Western monasticism. Here's a quote. Idleness is the enemy of the soul, and therefore the brethren ought to be employed in manual labor at certain times, at others in devout reading. Shortly after his papal inauguration in 590, Pope Gregory I penned Pastoral Care, a short exposition outlining the responsibilities of clergy. The work focused on how parish priests could best manage their flock and the standards a priest should be held to. Critics pointed out that many of the moral and intellectual standards Gregory espoused were unrealistic for the ordinary clergyman. Despite this, the book proved to be hugely popular in both the East and West. Byzantine Emperor Maurice ordered that it should be distributed among all the bishops within his empire. Here's a quote. No one does more harm in the church than he who has the title or rank of holiness and acts perversely. That completes our list of the great books of the early church though I'm sure I've missed a few that should be included among them. Let me know in the comments if there's a particular book from this era that deserves a spot on the list. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you'd like more. Also consider becoming a member by clicking on the join button on the right side of the channel page. You'll get unique perks and you'll be supporting our mission to reach more people with the ideas that built the West. As always, read on.